Hi, everybody. Eve Harrow, Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network, May 10th, 2021. The waning day, the waning hours of the 28th of the year, 5781, of course, Jerusalem Day here in Israel. And uh, a rather exciting afternoon that we're having. By the time you're hearing this, hopefully, all the smoke will literally have cleared. But just in the last hour, we've had uh, quite a bit of a to-do happening here. Um, for a brief split millisecond of a millisecond, I thought maybe I should call off this taping. And then I said, no, absolutely not. And you're about to hear why. First of all, hopefully everything will calm down and everyone will be well and no one will get hurt. And uh, somebody will figure out how to stop this whole mess. But in the meantime, I am delighted to have on the show tonight or today or whenever you're listening to it, Sean Kingsley, who's the editor of Rec Watch Magazine. Try and say that five times quickly. Uh, speaking to us from just outside of London. Sean, thank you so much for joining me on uh, Rejuvenation. Hi, Eve. Hi, Rejuvenation. A pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So a couple of weeks ago, I came across a fascinating article, uh, which it turns out was Sean was behind, and we, uh, and we arranged for this podcast. I think it's actually quite pertinent to have this topic on tonight because it is about King Solomon. King Solomon, who, according to the Bible, builds the first temple on the Temple Mount, which is kind of now ground zero today for a lot of the ruckus that we have here in Israel. And um, so it, it seems like really in theme. I'm not saying that everything that's happening here right now is because I was going to be taping this podcast and talking about King Solomon, but, you know, sometimes things just kind of come together in a very, very odd way. So, um, Sean, first of all, tell my audience, you know, who you are, how you got to where you are, and, and how you ended up researching this king from 3,000 years ago. Yeah, sure. So I'm a marine archaeologist. I go hunting shipwrecks, which I've been doing for uh, over 30 years now. Um, the last 10 years, we've been using robots. So going into international waters, going down to 5,000 meters. But it all started off for me in the late 1980s, actually off Israel, where I was working off door in one of King Solomon's 12 administrative right. um, headquarters. And it's incredibly rich. Israel's only sort of natural harbor with a set of offshore islands, stunningly beautiful. So it affected both the historian and the romantic in me. Um, and, you know, while I was diving there, um, you know, I'd hear all the stories about Solomon. There's a great uh, ancient settlement up on the hill, Tel Dor, which has these wonderful chambered um, gateways, which is supposed to be attributed to the United Monarchy. Um, and then you go and dive opposite these islands, and one of them is named after Tafat, who was the princess daughter of Solomon. And your mind whirs as a kind of what-if scenario. You know, over in England, we've got King Arthur. Over in Israel, you've got King Solomon, man, myth, whatever. But really what fascinates me is that Solomon shaped the world we live in. He's ancient, but he's modern. Yes, his Yes, he was a soldier, and lots of what he did started up as a kind of Game of Thrones environment. You know, his reign began in bloodshed when he created a, a, a palace coup right there near the Temple Mount in Jerusalem um, and broke the line of succession of his brother in Adonijah. But I don't want to talk about that element, really. I want to talk about one element that's really been ignored up to now. And everything that we know about Solomon comes from his wealth. And if we can find the source of his wealth, perhaps we can chip away these layers of myth and find out whether this was a man or a mortal or a myth. Uh -huh. So let me just ask you, because a lot of my listeners, both Christians and Jews and non-affiliated, um, do read the Bible regularly and, you know, are interested in the stories and in finding out more about that. Is, is that in your background at all? Or you kind of stu literally stumbled into this from the sea and because you were at door, kind of came into the story, or was there like something in your background that maybe piqued your interest and, and brought this two together? So I first went out to Israel when I was a teenager. Um, it, it was a long summer. My parents, our family are Jewish. Uh, we're, we're, we're not particularly religious. I'm certainly not religious. They kicked me out of the house and said, we've always wanted to go to Israel. Off you pop, son. Ah, oh, come on, it's full of bearded wonders, you know, doing this. That's just not me. It's, and you know, I went on a experience in Kibbutz Live, got to see some wonderful ancient sites and, and saw the secular side and the religious side of Israel and realized just what a wonderful, special place it was. Um, and good, bad or indifferent, I, I don't look at the Bible from a religious perspective. 
So I don't have a need to prove that Solomon really existed. I don't need mm -hmm. to read Kings and Chronicles. I'm looking at this purely from a historical perspective, almost a kind of journalistic fascination. Um, and, and I think in, in Israel, a lot of people, they talk about these things. You're on one camp or the other. It's all very black and white in Israel. You're either a believer, and sorry, you're either an unbeliever or you're a defender of the faith, as I call it. You know, it's one or the other. And it seems to me from my research that this is a very rainbow colored, nuanced argument. And I prefer to look at it as myth. Um, and in Israel, a lot of scholars, when they say something doesn't exist or it's false, they say it's myth. Well, that's not actually what myth is. Myth is something that goes all the way from completely make-believe through to truth. Now, the trick is to unravel, you know, that, that onion and find out what is at the heart of it and how much of it is true and how much isn't. And that's how I approach Solomon and the United Monarchy. All right. So that, that's interesting. I will take issue, though, about the black and white in Israel. I think it is much more nuanced than that. Um, and I can say that because I know a lot of archaeologists. I'm studying right now, actually, uh, for a degree in archaeology. And there are a lot of, the, for example, the late Adam Zertal, who I'm sure you were familiar with, came from a completely secular kibbutz and investigated a lot of where maybe, you know, maybe the book of Joshua happened and came to believe in that part of the, at least part of the good part of the book had happened because of the science. And then I know people who start off with a more, more religious bend and then get a little more, uh, I don't know, skeptical, but definitely, um, you know, the numbers don't always add up and, and they, you know, they start to, to think about the Bible as perhaps giving a message, but not necessarily every number was meant to be taken at face value. So it's actually very interesting what's happening here in Israel um, when it comes to that. So uh, so I, I see, you know, where you're coming from with that, and that's uh, that's pretty amazing. But how did you get from the kibbutz to becoming a, a marine archaeologist? Which, by the way, I've gone scuba diving a few times. I haven't in a few years. It is uh, for those of you who've never done it, it is the most incredible experience. It is so quiet, except for your own breathing. And you see the little fishies, and you realize how wonderful <laughs> the world is down below when we messed it up. <laughs> and they just kind of like, they do their own thing, and you float. And it's, it's, I'd say it's heaven on earth, but it's heaven in the water. So anyway, but so how did you get to do this, like for a living? Like go down and look for old things, you know, as a profession? Slightly, a little bit. I mean, I must okay. say. I think it's really interesting, I'm not going to get into it now, the psychology of, you know, believing in David and Solomon or not. Yeah. And I think actually at core, but irrespective of scientific purity, it's really hard to escape our own upbringings and our own... 100%. 100%. In action. So when these professors, and I don't like to name names, get up to the top of the ladder, they feel a real need to protect their bailiwick, their patches. So you'll have one saying... 100% this is David's palace and this is Solomon's wall. And you'll have another kind of bête noir, young punk, if you like, saying, no, it's rubbish. He never existed. Jerusalem was a one horse town and we right. don't have enough 10th century pottery to even put in a shoebox. So that's what I mean. I mean, that's on the record in the scientific publications. Oh, you totally. Beer and a dinner. Everybody's nice and polite, but you know, there's a reason why National Geographic called the hunt for David and Solomon archaeology's own contact sport. It gets mm -hmm. quite funny out there. Oh, and, oh, it does. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And archaeologists have egos like everybody else. And if you publish a paper that says X 10 years ago, and then somebody comes and says, well, actually, I found something that completely throws your uh, theory into the trash. So then, you know, like in any profession, that would that would be upsetting. But anyway, let's get but you're you're in the water. I mean, How did that happen? I was in a kibbutz. Uh, we went on a little trip up the way to, from kibbutz Magan Michel up to, uh, to Dor, where mm -hmm. there was a crazy great friend of mine called Kurave, a Dutch man who now lives on, on kibbutz Nasholim. And um, he started diving and he turned one of um, uh, Baron Rothschild's glass factories of the 19th century into a museum and dive center. Oh, so he's that, the one who's behind the museum? That's the an museum. unbelievable museum. It's one of the right. hidden gems in Israel. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Guys, go and visit it. Go to Northern Amazing. Wind. Go and dive with the team. So I, I hooked up with him and he took us on a tour. I come from a kind of public school background where everything's quite stiff. And here was this guy with his kid on his shoulders, waxing lyrical, full of, you know, charisma as you get in Israel. And at the end, I kind of went up and said, tapped him on the shoulder and said, Mr. Rebbe, Mr. Rebbe, do you take volunteers? 
and a broad smile. Oh, you should come here. We die if we dig tombs. And the Indiana Jones sitting on my shoulder said, I'll have a bit of that. And I did. I came back half a year later and, and I got the bug. Wow, that, that's incredible. Uh, I mean, I know that they have, I don't know if tourists can do it so much, like off of Caesarea, they have, well, they even have snorkeling because some of the remains are just like right there. I mean, you could see it just a meter below from some of Herod's palaces, the collapse in the water and everything. So, but I don't think people appreciate enough the field of marine archaeology. You know, most archaeologists that you speak to are getting dusty um, and not, uh, you know, not wearing, not wearing a wetsuit. But you want to earn a whip on the water. I don't no. Um, so, but have you, but have you, you dive, dove in, I don't, for, you're the British, you, you've got the English, the Queen's English, have you dived in? Uh, English, the Queen's English dived, um, the Yankee American dove. Dove, okay, yeah, uh, for, for in other, on other coasts, I mean, you just, you haven't just, uh, done it off of Israel, have you? Yeah, no, I started off in Israel, which was just beautiful, and, and uh, you know, in two and three meters, it's just a wonderful right. place to start and, and cut your teeth, but. You know, I found about 350 shipwrecks with various companies, you know, all around the world with work wow. from the UK. I'm the lead archaeologist on uh, the predecessor of Nelson's Victory, which is one of the greatest warships of the Age of Sail, all the way through to, you know, we've got everything from Phoenician wrecks off Spain all the way through to World War II submarines, German U-boats on secret missions. We found a wreck full of silver, but also we hit the post room and brought up a cache of 700 letters from 1940, the largest lost hoard wow. of mail. And more than that- But it survived? They had survived because they were inside a steel hull. This is the gift of the sea. On wow. land, everything is very deliberate. Occasionally you get a Pompeii effect of preservation, but people live, people die, people move on, they take their things away, they're recycled and melted down. When everything goes in the sea, it is frozen in time. Hmm. So on this wreck, you know, it was like a steel hull with freezing cold temperatures. It's like putting something in a fridge freezer for decades. Wow. Yes. Wow, that is fascinating. What is the oldest shipwreck, as far as we know, that's been found? Do you know offhand? Well, there's a bit of a competition. You know, people are always trying to push it back further and further. Um, I would go with the Uluburin shipwreck of Turkey, which dates to 1400 BCE, which was dug wow. by Professor George Bass, the father of underwater archaeology, who just passed away last month. Um, and it's got everything on it, you know, copper and tin ingots. Um, it's got pistachio nuts from the Holy Land. It's got material from Egypt. So to this day, having been dug in the 80s, you know, the archaeologists are still vying and arguing about where the ship actually traded. Was it Mycenaean? Was it Canaanite? Did it have an Egyptian link? And this is really important because it goes back to, is archaeology actually a pure and hard science? So if right. anybody really wants to fact check Solomon, good luck to you and knock yourself out. <laughs> absolutely right, because, you know, everyone knows about the Holy Land and its riches on land and linking it to the Old Testament and the New Testament, but they don't really know that beneath the waves, there's 500 glorious shipwrecks going back to the Bronze Age, everything linked to Napoleon, Romans, Byzantines, early entrepreneurs. And so that's why I wanted to do this special issue about Secrets of the Bible Seas for Wreckwatch magazine. And it got so excited, it was supposed to be 70 pages, that it ended up being 165 pages. So oh my God. if your listeners want to go and check it out, we make it free for educational purposes. Wreckwatchmagazine.com, sign in, plunge in. Literally plunge in. But, so a, a couple of like technical questions. Uh, these have to be much more expensive to dive to get a ship than it is to take a bucket and pail a few volunteers and go to some tell and start mucking around. Obviously it's a little more involved than that, but the costs are not, I would imagine, nearly as prohibitive as what you do. Do countries fund this? Are there private funders? It's a mix of both. Uh, it, there's a mix of both. There's a whole lot of models out there. I would say if you're doing shallow water work, if you're going to Ake or you're going to Dor or Margan Michael, you know, it's probably on a par with small teams that you would do on a, on a land excavation. It, it's manageable. Mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to find funding for any projects. Of course. Yes, I know that. Once you start getting a big research ship and a remotely operated vehicle that you're going to send down as your eyes and your hands, because man can't go and women can't go down beyond really 120 meters with rebreathers, it gets super expensive. And if you want to mm -hmm. recover, you know... I think you're probably these days looking at $35,000 a day to mobilize. Wow. 
Wow. I so I would, are, it's private but, companies? Yeah. So it's, I mean, to date, very rarely do governments or universities have that kind of money. <laughs> Definitely I mean, not. A new memoir just come out by uh, Bob Ballard, the man who found the Titanic. How do you go looking for the Titanic in the middle of nowhere off, off Canada? At, that's at crazy depth. You know, who pays for that? Right. Uh, and, and now in his memoir, he said, I can finally reveal, actually, Ronald Reagan sent me out to find two missing uh, new no kidding. Marines. And I said, hey, Ronnie, I'll do that. But, you know, here's my condition. I want to go find the Titanic. He said, well, whatever, just find the nuclear sub. So that gives you an idea. So work was going on in the Black Sea where they had this massive, incredible collection um, of wrecks going back to 500 BC intact because there's no oxygen down there. You know, they go on multidisciplinary, huge research ships. They're doing marine biology research, looking at other kinds of resources and looking for shipwrecks gets tacked on two or three days here or there generally. Mm -hmm. So what is, are the laws, international laws in terms of who keeps the tre let's say you said you mentioned silver and guts and sometimes you're gonna find gold or treasures or things that even aren't worth a lot, you know, but they're, they're priceless because they're old uh, or because they're so unique. But what is the law on who keeps them? Technically, if you find anything inside your territorial waters, which is out to 12 nautical miles in any country, uh, it belongs to that country. Okay. That's for a merchant vessel, unless it's a warship. There's some modern uh, legislation um, that says that any warship, wherever it, uh, wherever it lies, belongs to the, the flag of origins. So actually that was written, that law for modern stuff. So imagine an American or an Israeli uh, nuclear submarine went down off China is to prevent the other nation uh, messing around with their personnel or with their mm -hmm. state secrets, their military secrets. Some smart Alec managed to add to the list of warships, submarines, spaceships, airplanes, historic warships, you know, as if there are black boxes or military secrets on rotten wood. Right. So, so any warship belongs to the original state and we're actually- If it exists. Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly right. Can you imagine? Yeah, I'm going to find the Mycenaeans today. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, um, I mean, Spain is very aggressively claiming all their warships and all their merchant vessels because it has a lot of shiny stuff. You know, they went to Peru, Colombia, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people, killed hundreds of thousands of people, but they're still claiming all that treasure as their own. Can you imagine that you know, the Hebrew University is digging Masada and they find a Roman camp and in find it, they find some Roman armor and coins, etc. And they get very excited and you do a, a you know, a, a podcast on it. And suddenly, you know, suddenly um, Berlusconi or whoever's uh, got his hand on the reins and it's, <laughs> gives you a call and says, hey, come on, come on, stay. This is ours, hands off. Right. And that would be on land, that would be thrown out of court it would be a joke but underwater it's legally binding so we're trying to catch up um and in israel for instance they just find a huge hoard of shipwrecks in the leviathan gas field off door and it's all quite quiet right now we're trying to work out what really happened and because that's outside 12 nautical miles the israel yeah. antiquities authority who are you know they're very powerful they're very good at what they do and they have very good antiquities law they're saying we can't do anything about this you know it's outside of territorial waters so it belongs effectively to the gas company that discovered them so there's there's a lot of work that still needs to be Interesting. done fighting up legislation and the treasures belong to that company then because they're not making enough off the natural gas they also need the gold <laughs> I, I i i think you know if you're a developer the last thing you want to happen whether it's on with a hotel, a Hilton, Hilton a shipwreck. Uh, or offshore. You do not want to find archaeology. <laughs> What's the most interesting thing you've ever found? Gosh, the next thing I find is the most interesting thing. I think I love that the answer. Next thing you do. Um, I've been really lucky. I mean, you know, it's. I remember one day it was Rosh Hashanah off door in Israel. I'd gone away because all the hordes come and they swim and they sunbathe and it becomes a circus. I came back about five o'clock and the sun was coming down. It's beautiful with those sunsets of September time of year. And I looked in the sea and I could see there being a storm the night before. And the seabed was deep. You could see that the, the waves had carved out a, um, a kind of crater. So I went in, I grabbed my snorkel and I went down there and there was newly exposed wreckage. And as I'm looking along, along suddenly I start hyperventilating. And I see a Greek war helmet made of bronze with a moustache and a face 
dating to the 5th century BCE, oh, where people have wow. been snorkeling all day. And, you know, that, that blew my mind. But equally, at door, you know, I remember we found the bottom of an amphora, Byzantine, and we were cleaning it in the lab, and suddenly the whole place just exploded with the smell of guava. And this must have been uh, containing guava jam 1,400 years ago. So, you know, to be able to touch the, the past is incredible. To be able to smell it is quite mind-blowing. Wow, that's a great story. Yeah. Well, I've taken people to Dora because that's where they famously used to have the trailer, you know, get the snails and get the blue and the purple dye out of that. And they've found mounds and millions, I think, of shells offshore and dying vats and all of that. So um, a lot went on there. And it's so funny because, like you said, it's so peaceful now and people just come and swim and it's just a beautiful beach. But it, it saw a lot of history in the day, that little place. Uh, that's so exciting that you found that there. Wow. Okay, so let's get, I know everybody's like waiting with bated breath. Yeah, well, How did you get into Solomon? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Solomon. And it turns out his partner in, not crime, because all of it, I'm sure, was very above board, if you will. That wasn't a pun. I actually just said that. Um, King Hiram of Tyre. H How do you get these two guys in, in the sea? Well, you know, you see my background now and, uh, you know, I'm as fascinated with the sea as other archaeologists are on land. And I, I, you know, one of the things we have in Israel, you've got your face of the coal base. You're doing archaeology, you're excavating, they're publishing really well. Back in London, you know, I've got this critical distance. You know, I'm, I'm not involved in all the whole balagan and the craziness. You know, I can, I can smell and I can think and, you know, it's not as exciting in many ways, but, you know, it gives you time. It gives you time to contemplate. And I thought... Listen, there's, the jury is hung. There's a stalemate here. One person says one thing, the other says the other. And, and you know, how are we going to break uh, this, this stalemate? Um, and then I thought, well, you know, if it's true that Solomon really made silver as common as stones in Jerusalem, and if it's true he put 260 tons of silver into the temple walls, well, where did it come from? That assumes there had to be uh, infrastructure of warehouses, ports, ships, and where ships go, shipwrecks follow. So with a completely clear blank canvas, I just decided to do the world's first maritime audit of King Solomon. Okay, so where did you start? I started with the good old Bible, um, where there's this comment that it shows very clearly that he went into business with Hiram of Tyre in Lebanon, um, and together they pulled their resources um, and they went looking for the lands of Ophir and the lands of Tarshishish for gold, silver, apes, and peacocks, which basically just means sort of um, um, exotic goods, really, apart, right. from, apart from the metals. Um, um, and it seemed to me that, you know, you really need to find a place where there's a concentration of Near Eastern, early Iron Age material culture and masses of mining. Um, and over time, you know, we'd always go for family holidays down in southern Spain and You'd read thing in the newspapers, you know, I happened to be down there in Huelva and Cadiz when some really interesting excavations were going down. And I remember I visited Cadiz where they just started digging the foundations for the Teatro Comico, the comical theatre. And they bashed into some ancient remains, started digging them and found a crime scene. There was some well-appointed ancient villas on a, on a nice kind of terrace by the sea. And inside it, there'd been a fire and there were two skeletons. Ooh, and one ooh. of the skeletons they did DNA, DNA on and they found that it was an immigrant first generation to a Phoenician father. And they dated it early to 820 BCE. That's really very early. And it got my mind thinking. And I thought, how far can we push this story back? And what was this Phoenician kid doing all the way on what must have been the far side of the moon? 5,200 kilometers away from Jerusalem thousands of years ago. Hmm. Okay, and where did you go from there? So from there, we started kind of trying to, you know, I got a car and I just started traveling around, doing a lot of research, you know, digging into the archives as well. Um, and I went up to Rio Tinto, which is the greatest ancient mine in the world. Um, now these sprawling, it's, it's an incredible scene of this dystopian Mad Max environment of polluted blood red river running through this area. Uh, really very surreal. Um, but at the heart of it are these ancient mines. Most people know about the Roman material, uh, but they don't know that there's far, far earlier stuff. So 
right at the heart of it, there used to be a hill. And on that hill, I looked in the archives and I checked back on some old reports, when they started clearing that in anticipation of doing, um, doing modern mining, they found these ancient remains. And it turned out on the hilltop, beneath, uh, on top rather, of a, of a spring, there was this 900 meter wide village of rectangular houses and thatched roofs. And inside it, it was full of mining material, pestles, mortars, and pottery. But the amphoras, the jars, and the uh, oil lamps were all Phoenician from the Near East. 30% of the pottery was Phoenician, and it was even fused um, to silver droplets. So there's no doubt that there was a link between mining and refining of silver at this place. And they dated that to the early 19th century. Uh, beg your pardon. They dated that to the, in the, sorry, yes, the early 9th century BCE. And when I went and looked into the Spanish archives, I was amazed that in local folklore, they called this hill Chero Solomon, Solomon's Hill. Mm. So again, it's part of that myth that we're trying to unravel that shows there was association between Near Eastern people, Solomon and mining. Now from there, there's three really important sites in this story. Uh, we've got Rio Tinto where they're mining the silver, the Phoenicians and the Near Eastern uh, colleagues um, and they're refining it. Then they're taking that ore uh, to Huelva, which is the port city just on the coast um, of the Atlantic Mediterranean. Um, and in the middle of there, there's a city square and it's dominated by a massive statue of Christopher Columbus. And he's pointing to the Americas like this. And it's kind of ironic that Columbus was going off to the far side of the world, to the Americas, in search of his own El Dorado, which he thought was actually King Solomon's gold. Whereas actually mm. the source of the El Dorado was not 70 kilometers upriver from where he was, irony of ironies. And beneath that statue, in the heart of Huelva, in the Plaza de Monjas, they found this incredible collection of, uh, um, of Phoenician and local material where they were taking that ore, melting it down in sandstein molds and refinery walls and turning it into silver ingots for export through the port of Cadiz. And in those deposits, fascinatingly, you find all these kind of Near Eastern and Phoenician signature sets of material culture. So they have um, elephant tusks, ivory waste and finished products from actually making art. Um, they also have wooden Morton tenons, which is how you make ships in the Mediterranean. And alongside it, they also have Murex shells for making purple dye, the royal wow. purple. And incredibly, shekel and half shekel weights. And that material has been radiocarbon dated to at least 900 BCE and seemingly to 930 BCE. So finally, this evidence of mining overlaps with the end of the reign of King Solomon. Wow. Just wow. So, okay, so let's just, for my listeners who aren't familiar, Phoenicia, more or less today's Lebanon, the northern coast of Israel, right? That's how, that's where you would place it? The heartland started in Sidon and Tar, went, crept down all the way to Sarepta, and then at, at the kind of the heart of the Phoenician period, it actually went all the way down to the Carmel. Dor was part of Phoenicia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were, I mean, they would be faring, but then you have Solomon and not really talks about that. I mean, I don't, you know, they talk about him in terms of land and building palaces. Is there any mention of him with any kind of connection to having ships other than obviously he's bringing this all in from somewhere? Because your theory is that they were partners, that Solomon was kind of backing the whole business, and the Phoenicians were the ones with the know how and the ability, they were sailors, to go out and actually get it done. Yeah, we're in the land of reconstruction here because, as you say, you know, we don't have the facts on our own. Exactly. Uh, my, my, my reconstructed grand theory is that, yeah, Solomon was the Anastas of his era. Uh, he bankrolled these ventures. Uh, the Phoenicians were amazing sailors. They, they, they took the risk um, and went onto the outsea. It's kind of an analogy rather like China in antiquity. So China, massive country, very rich in the Tang period, which is the ninth century of the Common Era and earlier. Um, it didn't let its people go out in the sea because it didn't really see the need to. So mm -hmm. you had Persian sailors from the Arab Gulf who come all the way out to China in their, in their dows, and they undertook all that kind of risk, paid and sponsored by uh, the Tang court. And I see a kind of similar, similar analogy. Now, the key source is the book of Ezekiel. And let me just kind of read this for your, your listeners. 
and it says Tarshish, which is the land of Tarshish, which I believe is Huelva, which was Greek Tartessos, which becomes Tarshish. Wow. Tarshish did business with you because of your great wealth of goods. They exchanged silver, iron, tin, and lead for your merchandise. Judah and Israel traded with you, i.e. with Tarshish. They exchanged wheat from Minith with confections, honey, olive oil, and balm for your wares. The ships of Tarshish serve as carriers for your wares. You are filled with heavy cargo as you sail the sea. Now, here we get into a methodological issue, which is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit cerebral, but we'll get into it very quickly. How do we find shipwrecks underwater? We find them because they have masses of amphoras or ballast or latterly in the colonial area, iron cannon and bronze guns, fixing them down on the seabed. They're stuck, they can't get anywhere. Now, if you're shipping olive oil, confections, and honey in sacks, that's not going to register in the archaeological record. Right. If you're a Phoenician ship and you've got amphoras full of wine or silver and heavy metals, that is going to register in the archaeological record. I think that's another element why we're not yet picking up this trail. Also, of course, marine archaeology is you know, not even 60 years old, really. Mm hmm. Uh huh. So the things that the Judeans would have exported wouldn't have survived necessarily underwater because it's in organic material, essentially, which is going to just fall apart. All right. As opposed to the to the clay. Fascinating. Have you been able you talked about the guava jam exploding all over you uh, earlier in the earlier in our talk? Ha, do they have the ability now to look into these amphora, which are two handle jugs um, and uh, see what we, you know if there was food in them and be able to somehow with with the phenomenal leaps and bounds that we're having now in these kind of chemical analysis figure out perhaps what kind of food was in them or liquid oil wine whatever yeah you're right the appliance of science is just really exciting oh my God. Right phenomenal um, maybe it goes too far i think it's really important to ask a set of questions of the data rather than just acquire the data and throw science at it um, but anyway, I mean, one of the gifts of underwater archaeologists, you generally do find the grapes, the olive pits, still inside the basis of the jars. Uh, but there are sites of Greece, for instance, which were dug all the way back by Cousteau, the very important site of Antikythera, uh, first century BC, that was full of statues, which is why they've gone back there, to see if they can find the rest of the statues that rolled down the, you know, mm -hmm. the valleys. Um, and they've got sherds, the sherds that Cousteau kind of blew up, as it were. Um, yeah, and you're right, they can do check the, the lining, do DNA analysis on it, and find out precisely what the last tinner was. Um, I, I went to a talk on this, and the chemist expert, he said to me, the kind of resolution of um, our ability to detect this stuff is imagine if you ran a bath and you put your finger in that bath, we'd be able to detect the oil from your finger. And that's how wow. science has got. <laughs> That, that's, that's really just insane. I mean, I know they're doing some incredible things here in Israel, germinating ancient seeds. And, you know, I took a course with one of the Zohar Amar who, uh, who I mean, they're very involved with finding seeds, regrowing the things that were growing here before and checking things out. It's, it's, it's such an exciting field. Did they have, where are the, where are the best labs for that? Because uh, that is such an exact science. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that the University of Haifa people underwater, they're doing stuff locally in Israel, oh, yeah? analyzing bones found in a, a late antique ship, like off Magan Michael, and they've written for us as well. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's plenty of places for specializing. Of course, uh, interdisciplinary research is, is the buzzword of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you'd said to me maybe 10 years ago, well, 15 years ago, wow, you know, all this material and these links and Phoenician material finding in Andalusia and here's some Phoenician pottery, I would have just said, this is a hoax, you're just making it up. But because the science, as you say, has improved so much, you know, you can't negate it. In the same way that back in Israel, I think about 53 silver hordes have now been found from Akko to Tel Kisan right. uh, to Tel Dor. And they've analyzed these uh, through uh, lead isotope analysis. They've been able to prove that in the 10th century BCE, the silver is coming from Turkey and Sardinia. But in the 9th century BC, suddenly the lights go out there. And guess what? It's coming from Andalusia from these sites. Hmm. Wow. So the 9th century is already after Solomon's time. 9th century is from, after Solomon's Which is the big debate. Yeah. There is a big debate going Big on. debate, 9th or 10th. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, it doesn't upset me so much. I'm not pu so purist about this because are we actually surprised? Uh, I mean, you, the Kings, Kings and Chronicles was not written in the 10th century BCE. You know, these were 
oral societies who they didn't have a sense of time depth. They didn't sit, sit there in the 10th century and say, remember that Moses bloke who went all the way down to Egypt and had a hard time? You know, they, they didn't have a sense of chronology, which is why they told stories and they sat around camps and at festivals every year. The religious priest or the shaman or whoever, you know, would repeat these and they, they'd be passed down the generations. So Kings and Chronicles was only committed down to paper in Jerusalem under King Josiah in the 7th century BCE. And of course, they're not going to get everything right. I, I one would presume they had some royal archives. One would also presume that they wanted to create an epic foundation myth for Israel. So some things will get put right and some things put wrong. But Kings and Chronicles was only finalized, we think, in its current form uh, when the Israelites, the Jews, came back from exile in Babylon in, after in the 580s, in the 6th century BCE. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a very difficult set of historical information just to kind of pin it on. Uh, another analogy, I suppose, is, you know, do I believe that a guy called Romulus suckled on a wolf to become the first king of Rome? No, I don't, but look at the myth. You know, on the Palatine above the Tiber recently, they found a shrine to the Lupercal, to the wolf's lair above a cave where they believe that this happened. And nearby, they excavated a whole bunch of roundhouses from a village dating to the 8th century BCE when Romulus was supposed to live. So that's the kind of association that, you know, right. makes it seem plausible that a Romulus, that a um, Solomon existed. Don't forget, of course, you know, there's a, another very famous Jew who done good. Who we have no proof at all that he existed during his lifetime. But he went to define the faith of Christianity. There's no evidence for a Jesus Christ in the first century whatsoever. But we, right. we, we tend to accept that a lot more than we do for the United Monarchy, which I think is interesting. So given that they really had this, like, this gold route, do you have any theory about why this ended? I mean, they've got a great thing going on here. Solomon or somebody, uh, some powerful entity who is doing what the Bible says King Solomon is doing during that time period um, is in, you know, they got a great business happening here. Any, any theories? Was, was there a catastrophe? You know, was there a global warming, which is the very in thing to say, or some kind of volcanic eruption or famine or some kind of massive destructive earthquake tsunami that would have ended it? Or you don't, you didn't find that there. You just fi found kind of an abandonment. How, how did that work? Why did the great silver rush of the early Iron Age end? That's a good question. I'm pleased you brought it up. Um, the Phoenicians, of course, they went on to do amazing things. We got about 53 shipwrecks around the Mediterranean from Gozo in Malta to Mazaron in Spain to Turkey to deep water off Akko, all the way through to the 8th century to the 6th century BCE Phoenician remains. You know, they went on to do amazing things. Great success story. Why did Solomon, Solomon and the United Monarchy drop from the economic pages of history? Very, very clear because, you know, because he was a human and because he erred. And this is where we can go back to the Bible. And this is actually one of the things that I really like and find very interesting about the Solomon story, is we know this was, this was the man who was supposed to be the incubator of world religion. He invented monotheism, you know, worship of the one faith in one place in Jerusalem. But then he got his head turned by some very pretty women, right? Supposedly, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Again, these figures are always exaggerated, but, you know, the texts say that he has, was married to an Egyptian pharaoh's wife. He was married to women from Sidon, from Moab, from Amman. Um, and to keep them sweet and happy, you know, he loved these women very much. He turned away from worship of the one God um, and put up shrines to Astarte of Sidon and Milcom, the abomination of, um, of Iman. And therefore, supposedly, God cut him out of the succession line um, and gave the royal line to, um, I forget his name right now. Um, his son, Rehavam. Jeroboam, that's right. Yeah, well, it splits, uh, right. Yeah, so I think that's the answer why there, there's, a, there's just a, a cessation there. Mm hmm. That's an interesting answer. It's almost theological, like he got punished. But what I really almost like <laughs> is, is I like the kind of modernist twist on that, um, that Solomon was a human being. We think about him as this great visionary composer, soldier, 
uh, you know, inventor of world religion, but actually he was kind of like you and I and like the modern day. This was a multiracial, religiously tolerant environment. I think that's quite an important lesson for the modern world. Well, I mean, Jewish tradition holds that the time of Solomon was, you know, one of the most peaceful, as close to messianic as we ever, you know, messianic in terms of everybody living together nicely as we ever got to in the, uh, at least, you know, in history as, as we understand it now. Although I would think that most people would probably say that Abraham was the, fond the founder of monotheism, not the first Jew, but the first person to say, I think this is just one address. For all for all our requests, but not, um, not, but not, 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 not in Greek Jerusalem. Yeah, like, not in Jerusalem. The, yeah, clues in the name. Sort of right. Shalom, peace. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the builder of the temple, which becomes the focal point for Jewish worship for for a few hundred years and destroyed and rebuilt, and still being uh, haggled over as right. we speak, right. <laughs> as we tape this podcast. So in a way, I suppose his legacy is still lived on, although not necessarily in a way that he might have been so delighted about. Um, Sean, this has been like really absolutely fascinating. Anything that you want to add? Is, we'll, we will put your the link into the you know of your magazine uh, into the show so that people can go and meander about. Um, is there anything like uh, other biblical searches that you will go on? Or, uh, you know, did this like pique your curiosity as to? using the Bible as a uh, new, you know, New Testament as some kind of jumping off point, if you will, um, and seeing, you know, what's going on in the Mediterranean, which really was the center of the world at the time, of the known world at the time. That was the sea before Christopher Columbus and everybody goes off exploring of the known world, or at least the West, what we call the Western world. Anything else that, uh, that you have like cooking that you can share with us? We'll, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, I've been very fortunate. I've always gone pan and pan. I've always gone sort of in tandem, hand in hand with maritime archaeology and biblical archaeology. And right. Um, I wrote a book on a, um, called God's Gold, the Quest for the Temple Treasure of Jerusalem some years ago. Um, a few years ago, I was incredibly lucky that we actually went off uh, Lebanon um, outside oh. territory waters and we found 12 shipwrecks in 2,000 meters. Um, from what time period? Uh, from Roman. Roman, Byzantine, Ottoman. Oh. Uh, cool. Pristine, untouched. And we published those in the latest issue of Redwatch magazine alongside the Solomon story. So, you know, people can pick up all that stuff on uh, redwatchmagazine.com. But there are other things we're kind of cooking, um, but, you know, they're not quite there yet. But I look forward to sharing them with your listeners in the future. Okay. And your material is free. People can just go in to the yeah. magazine. The magazine okay. is free, you know, we wanted to make it about education. There's a lot of politics and archaeology, as you know, as there is also on the Really? <laughs> uh, but I wanted to turn the clock back. I think it's really important to, I wanted to return to the kind of golden age and uh, the silent seas of Jacques Cousteau, a sense of awe and beauty of the fishmen and fishwomen of the ocean. And that's really why I, I sort of set up this magazine. Um, and we wanted to be free for education and just to kind of promote the underwater gospels. Right. Wow. Amazing. Um, it sounds like you have many years ahead of you of, uh, of, of diving. So you told me before we started taping that you have a new member of your family, an eight week old son. So when do, when do you put the wetsuit on and the, uh, <laughs> how old? Can't well, carry a tank. He looks is going to have a lot of options, you know. I'm Jewish, English, my wife's Chinese, you know, he'll, he'll be able to choose oh from all, all different cultures. Um, at the moment, he's growing very fast. He's in a very big baby grow, so um, he can't quite fit in it. So I'm already calling him Flipper because of the flipping of the bottom of his feet. But, um, amazing. Amazing. Very, very exciting. Okay. Thank you so much, Sean Kingsley, editor of Rec Watch magazine for sharing with us really some of the adventures that you had. And I know you just shared a little bit um, of some of the incredible things that you've done over the last few years, but really this is a, this is a fascinating look into possibly, you know, the reign of Solomon and, uh, and what was going on during that time period and, uh, and really thinking out of the box, which is, which I appreciate very much. Um, a very untradi untraditional, untraditional, uh, way of coming about it. So uh, thank you for joining me here, me here today on Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. And thank you to all my listeners and to Ben and Tabitha for putting this show out. 
And uh, take care, everybody. Hopefully, I haven't heard any sirens while we've been taping this, so hopefully things have calmed down now. And we'll continue to calm down until the next one. And, um, and again, thanks so much, everyone, for joining me. Uh, be well, everybody, and take care. That's it for now.